I bet Pastor Rob never started a sermon with Cookie Monster. <laughs> I have a question, and you can only answer this question if you are under the age of 12. What does Cookie Monster like to eat? As a teacher, you always go with the person who does not raise his hand. Louder? Cookies. Ah, Cookie Monster likes to eat cookies. Is that his favorite thing? What is Cookie Monster's favorite thing? Simple question here. Cookies. cookies. Does the Cookie Monster eat broccoli? No. Cookie Monster does not eat broccoli. What do you think? Why do you think the Cookie Monster likes cookies so much? Now this one can open up if you're under 20. <laughs> Why do you think the Cookie Monster likes cookies so much? You're not under 20. <laughs> I was hoping. <laughs> Why does the Cookie Monster, I have just one hand? I have two hands. I have three hands like an auction all of a sudden. <laughs> Why does the Cookie Monster only like cookies? That was my question, I believe. Why does the Cookie Monster only like cookies? I don't know, because cookies are good. <laughs> because cookies are good. Is that his favorite thing? You say so. Are we all in agreement that the Cookie Monster's favorite thing is cookies? Is that an arounding amen? Amen. Very good. What is your favorite thing? What is your favorite thing? And please, do not start singing raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens. What is your favorite thing? More specifically, what is your favorite Bible verse? What is your, and now this is open to everybody. And I have a mic. And you've seen that I will go to someone even if your hand is not up. What is your favorite Bible verse? What is your favorite? Right, hey. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. Thank you. What is your favorite Bible verse? Do you have a favorite Bible verse? Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Very good. And do you remember where it's from? No. Yeah. We have the verse. Favorite Bible verse? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Whoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. All right. Amen. Hey, we have uh, kids outnumbering and out-participating <laughs> the other people. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Favorite Bible verse? Uh, mine is the same as my dad's, Micah 6 verse 8. What does God desire of you? To love mercy, show justice, and walk humbly with your God. Thank you. in the back corner here. I like to walk around. I mean, I'm not afraid to walk around, and I have a cordless mic. What is your favorite Bible verse? You don't know what the next question is, so you might want to get this question done, and you're, you're, you're picked. You won't be bothered again. What is your favorite Bible verse? We don't have hands coming up yet. Favorite Bible verse? My favorite one is um, Philippians. Um, I can do all things through Jesus. All right. Okay, the question's getting a little bit harder now. If we were to, to look at one book of the Bible, and I'm going to say the book because I have the mic. If we were going to look at the book of Psalms, what is your favorite psalm? 
is your favorite psalm. You don't need to recite the whole thing. If there's a verse from the psalm or the psalm itself, uh, take, it? take this, take, take this. No, okay. Speak into it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Any answer? Uh, yeah, uh, Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my, thank you. The Lord is my shepherd. What is your favorite psalm? A different psalm, perhaps. I still don't have a lot of hands in the back. Oh, we have one hand there. What is your favorite psalm? Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. That's a great song. Still, the kids are out there, the adults. I, I... Um, God is stronger. God is stronger. We, we just sang. A psalm within the, uh, the book of Psalms. There's 150 to choose from. What's your favorite psalm? Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Thank you. Psalm 8. Another favorite psalm. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Thank you. I think Greg just wants the mic. <laughs> Be still and know that I am God. Thank you. Psalms 133, behold how good and how great it is to dwell with our brethren in unity. Hmm. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that came down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. Hmm. It went down to the skirts of his garments. Wow. Very good. Thank you. One more favorite psalm. Psalm 91. And do you remember some verses from it? It talks about uh, refuge and under its wings and arrows flying in the night. Thank you. Psalm 139. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. Hmm. Thank you. I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about one of the psalms. The fa fact was the first psalm that was mentioned this morning. Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is often cited as the most favorite psalm or the psalm that we know the most, or a psalm that we appreciate, a psalm that gives us lots of comfort. It's our favorite. What I would like us to do, okay, do I have control? There we go. What I'm going to do today is take a little bit of a short, a brief look at uh, only one verse in this psalm. Verse 1. It's a good place to start, the beginning, right? Jesus, my Lord, Jesus, my shepherd. I was asked to give a title to my, my, my sermon, and this is what came to me. Let's take a look at this. What I would like us to do is read this psalm together, because most of you didn't volunteer to speak in the mic. Now it's your turn to speak. We are going to split this into two. This half starts, then this half. And as the colors change, you should know that you're changing too. I think that's pretty straightforward. Psalm 23, why is it a favorite? I think of all the psalms that you might see in the movies, it'll be Psalm 23 that they choose, or on a TV show. 
I can remember the first time that Psalm 23 really resonated with me. It was over the phone, actually. My grandmother had passed away, and my mother had gone, had flown to Europe for the funeral. And then the dad took care of the boys. And then there was this phone call and where my mother kind of talked about what happened at the funeral, how the process went, and my dad asked, what did the pastor speak on? And the, 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 the chapter that was spoken on was Psalm 23. And at that point, I mean, they were talking a little bit in Dutch, a little bit of English, and then dad shared with us, what is Psalm 23? I was just a, a younger boy. And then I learned the comfort behind the message of Psalm 23. I think what people appreciate so much, whether or not they think this through, and this is what we're going to try and do this week and a little bit next week, is that Psalm 23 is rich. It is full of practical theology. Theology that you can take with you and apply to your lives, apply to your thinking. The psalmist teaches us to look at the world to see it as God would want us to see it. If we are anxious, Psalm 23 offers us courage to overcome our fears. If we are grieving, the psalm offers us comfort to find our way in the valleys of life. If our lives are filled with unpleasant people, the psalm teaches us how to deal with them. If the world threatens to wear us down, the psalm guides us to replenish our soul. And if we are obsessed with what we don't have, the psalm teaches us gratitude for what we do have. If we feel alone and adrift in a friendless world, this psalm offers us the promise that thou art with me. This psalm, only six verses, and we just read that, is, is full, full of application, full of practical theology. We can learn more about God in, as, in, in our walk, in our lives. What I'd like to do is break up verse 1. The first part is, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And there is a good reason that the psalmist chose a shepherd. Herding sheep was common in those days, let's say. Everybody could understand, well, what does that mean, the Lord is my shepherd? Our challenge is that how many people here herd sheep? Nope, no hands have gone up. So no one here is herding sheep. Actually, we have some friends of the congregation who do herd sheep, but they're not here today. So very few of us understand what does it mean to herd sheep. So to better understand Psalm 23, either we have to understand what does it mean to herd sheep, or we have to draw a new comparison that we would understand in our day and time, in our cultural context. Now, Jesus knew what it meant to herd sheep. And so he was very able to talk about himself in the light of being a shepherd. What I'm going to try and do in the next couple minutes is taking uh, some of Jesus' words from the book of John. And in the book of John, Jesus shares seven I am's. The seven I am's. We see here them listed. I am the bread of life. I am the light. I am the gate. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and life. And I am the vine. I missed the center one, if you were kind of following the picture. Oh, you missed one. That center one, I am the good shepherd. In John 10, verse 11, Jesus makes a bold claim, and he says, I am the good shepherd. Immediately, his disciples and anyone listening to him would have thought Psalm 23, because they, had, they would have learned that in their regular visits to a synagogue or to the temple. As part of their teaching, all children learned what we would call now the Old Testament. 
So Jesus made an association that people would have caught immediately. Jesus is comparing himself to the shepherd in Psalm 23. I am the good shepherd. What I'm going to try and do is suggest that not only did Jesus do this, but Jesus gave many more hints with those seven I am's that he is indeed the shepherd that the psalmist talks about. The psalm often starts a psalm of David. What is interesting is that we actually don't know if David wrote that psalm. We like to think he did. It's a very nice idyllic picture that David wrote this psalm while he was tending sheep. We actually don't know that. But to be a psalm of David means that perhaps it was written in the ideas that David would have had, or it's written for a king in the line of David, or in the, of the house of David. Jesus is in that line of David, the house of David. There's an immediate connection, and that I would like to suggest today that the disciples would have caught that right away. And I would like us to try and look at Scripture in such a way that we start to catch those little connections. Let's see what, what we can do with that. So what does it mean to be a shepherd? A good shepherd, in fact. What does it mean to be a shepherd? What are some of the things that a shepherd does that Jesus is saying he does also? The first, or, and these are in, in a fairly random order. They're not in one in hierarchy. The first is the shepherd is responsible to feed and water the sheep. The shepherd guides the flock from a watering source to a watering source, to green pastures for them to, to gather grass, to eat. And once that's used up, they move on. And that's the day's activities. Jesus, in the same way, is one who offers us food and water. Jesus said in John chapter 635, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, I don't know if the disciples caught that, but our vantage point with Scripture is that we can now see the connection. Just as shepherds would feed and water their flocks, Jesus provides, it serves as our bread of life. Shepherds would protect their sheep. They would protect the flock. They'd be out with the flock all day. They would protect from any animals that might come through. And at night, the, the flock of sheep would be herded into a pen. And there's a one way in and out of the pen. And shepherds would be, would be in rotation. Who is guarding that pen overnight? And in the same way, that, that shepherd would serve as the gate. Jesus said, I am the gate. Jesus said in John 10, verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. A shepherd would help deliver lambs, meaning then through the birthing process. The shepherd would be there to help the sheep as the flock would grow. And in the same way, that they, it's like the, the, the process of birthing, bringing life forward. And in the same way, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. In John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. See, only through faith, uh, faith in Jesus, can a person be born again and be saved. Remember in John 3, I tell you the truth, he said to Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Shepherds are involved in that birthing process. The, uh, Jesus is presenting himself to, here, I am involved in offering new life to all. Shepherds will, will 
Look for sheep that have wandered off. Shepherds will look to find their lost sheep. Perhaps we remember the parable in Luke 15. Jesus told them a parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. The goal for the shepherd is to bring the flock together, to not let any be lost or go astray. In a similar way, to serve as a light. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. A shepherd is responsible for shearing and grooming the sheep, taking off the fleece. And shearing is generally carried out in the springtime. Now, in order to, to present a little bit, I had to investigate a little bit what is, this, what is that process done. I have seen sheep being sheared on a, on a farm, and I had a chance to observe that, and what does the sheep go through. And it's very good for the sheep because it allows the, the fleece to come off. It's no longer heavy. A heavy fleece could cause heat stress for sheep. A bulky fleece decreases sheep mobility. Shearing and grooming the sheep helps the sheep's walk, the sheep's life. And in the same way, Jesus tells us, I am the vine. I am the vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Of course, perhaps the most important aspect is that the shepherd leads the sheep from one area to another. From one pasture to a pasture, watering source to watering source. And Jesus said too, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To claim the Lord is my shepherd is to acknowledge that Jesus is indeed our Savior, the one who has our best interests at heart. He cares for us. He will keep us safe. And he provided numerous glimpses of that through his I am statements. It acknowledges that hopefully we are ready to follow him. We may live in a rather unpredictable world a world that can be full of dangers, where bad things may happen to us. Still, to claim that the Lord is my shepherd is to acknowledge that we don't need to face these challenges alone. We have a shepherd who will lead us. And I believe this is the central message of the 23rd Psalm. The first five words tell it all. The psalm then expands, and there's more to consider. What does this look like every day when we are in these various situations or dealing with these odd people? I shall not want. Turning to the last part of this verse. Now, I want to be honest. I want that. That is a nice car, truck, SUV. We have talked about this. That would pull my trailer with no worries when we go camping. Have you seen Weston? He's only four. Can you imagine the leg room he's going to need when he's taller than me? That's going to have the leg room. There's comfort in there. I want that truck. 
I shall not want. First verse, and I have an existential problem. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I want that. There's many things I might want. Then I could go to the mountains in the wintertime. Four-wheel drive. Go off-roading. I could pull other trailers and do it in comfort. So is it wrong to want that? If the Lord is my shepherd, is it wrong for me to want the 2013 Toyota Sequoia XLE? <laughs> I don't have the money for it, but is it wrong for me to want that? Is this what the psalmist is suggesting when he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want? I think part of the problem, and we're going to see if we can answer that question, part of the problem is a question of translation. When we say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, we are comfortable with this. This is the way we've always heard it. This is the, the King James Version. You know, we have to think, when was the King James Version written? The King James Version was written back in the days of King James. Right? So it's kind of in the, the, uh, like the time of Shakespeare, let's say. And what does it mean to want? In, this ver in that time, to want is not a question of desire. Like, I desire this truck. To want is to be without. To want is to be lacking. Or perhaps not measuring up to the standards. If you remember... In the book of Daniel, King uh, Balthazar, I believe, was holding a banquet, and a hand came out and wrote four words on the wall, and nobody could translate it except Daniel. And one of the words translates in English, to want. God was telling the king uh, in essence, that you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Meaning, you haven't measured up. You're lacking something. You are lacking your effectiveness as a king. And in fact, what happened that night, the king was dead. He was murdered. I shall not want perhaps means something more along the lines of lacking. Now, Bible versions have struggled to get this concept across. We are going to do something again. This time we'll start on this side. This is the King James. I would like this side to read the verse, and let's see if we can note how the verse is going to change before we get at the NIV. All right? So we'll do it kind of like this. I don't have different colors this time, though. We have different verses. This side. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is the new century version. Slight change. This is the good news version. message. Nothing I lack. I lack nothing. This emphasis on having or not having. The Lord is my shepherd, NIV translates for us. I lack nothing. I lack nothing. What does that mean? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Do I need something? I could still want that truck, but I lack nothing. To me, it tells me that I am obviously 
blessed. I'm not just blessed. You're not just blessed. We are not just blessed. We are obviously blessed. It is so evident that we are blessed. It is so evident that we are blessed. Perhaps this is the lesson of the second part of this line as we begin the psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack for nothing. I am so blessed. Are you blessed? Who would like to share a blessing that you have? No Can you say it? No cancer. No cancer. Amen. Are you obviously, obviously blessed? What would you like to say? Where is your blessing? Are you obviously blessed? I'm God's child. Amen. Are you blessed? I have three meals a day and I have a shelter. Amen. Are you blessed? I'm blessed with not being sick a lot. Amen. Are you blessed? Who else is obviously blessed? Don't be shy. Excuse me. I'm blessed. I have four beautiful daughters and 11 grandchildren. Amen. Who else is blessed? Obviously blessed. I am blessed with 30 years with a Christian man. Hallelujah. I lack nothing. Who lacks nothing? Who lacks nothing? Can you share a blessing? I just have everything I need always. Always. See, I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Who else would like to share an obvious blessing? An obvious blessing. I'm just very thankful. Uh, um, on last Saturday, I was so blessed to have people praying for me for my swimming competitions. I have parents who love me. All right. Obviously blessed. It is so evident. It is plain in front of our face. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I feel blessed just knowing that... Uh, all my sins are forgiven and where I'm going to spend eternity. Thank you. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. In John 10, verses 10 and 11, I have come that they who know me may have life and have it to the full. I lack nothing. Do you lack? Are you found wanting? It's okay to have desire. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now that is a blessing. I have a shepherd. I am following a shepherd. See, I am following a shepherd who fills my needs. The most important of which was coming to earth and dying 
for the forgiveness of my sins. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And that's okay. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this gift. You are my shepherd. And I lack nothing. And that's okay. I pray that we can remember this in our walk this week. You are my shepherd. You're leading us. I lack nothing because you have so richly provided. And that's okay. Let us take that to heart, I pray, Lord, that you could give us strength to do just that. When the challenges of this week face us, we can say, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And that's okay. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.